of Edward Adamson, the, the man who uh, set up and supervised and enabled uh, the activity in the, in, in the art studio. Uh, he's a, a man called John Timlin, and he's still alive, and he, he kind of really helped us with the film. Did all the archival footage come easy, or was that a very hard research and um, acquiring process? It was quite a lengthy process. We brought in an archive researcher who Lisa Marie and I had both worked with before, Jim Anderson, who we thought would be a good fit with Ed and Pia, and they really kind of gave him the task of finding archive from within the asylums, um, because we really, one of the kind of um, um, ambitions and kind of intentions with the film was to really we, the only evidence we had of the patients lives was the art that they left behind um, and so we really wanted to find ways to help um, help us all kind of understand the circumstances in which they were living and producing that work so he did a big trawl through the archives and then Ed brilliantly um, discovered the Surrey History Archive which is where all the black and white photographs come Oh, sorry, Pia brilliantly discovered it. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Pia discovered it, and that was a real find because, uh, and the other kind of key, crucial bit of archive that we found, that you found very early, was um, the, te the oral testimonies that you hear, which are patients from the asylum, and that's within the British Library. So it kind of came together piece by piece, but it was quite lengthy. Um, well, abandoned goods clearly means not only the artifacts and the art, but also the individuals who created them and were abandoned in the asylums. How much was the movie about the state of mental care in the middle of the 19th century, of the 20th century, and how much of it was about the art itself? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sure we've both got things to say about that, but I think we were trying to find a balance, um, and we really wanted to focus the film around the artwork and to use that metaphorically. Um, so we tried to sort of look at the treatment chronologically and see how it evolved um, across the 20th century, both in the art studio and in the asylum. Uh, and there's actually kind of a neat parallel because at the moment, that, that, that historically at which the, the art collection was kind of left uh, neglected, and ended up in these quite unhappy storage conditions in, a, in, a, in another hospital in South London. That was around the time as the hospital closed, and that was part of a <coughs> nationwide program of closing the asylums. Uh, it was a, a policy called Care in the Community, and it was a kind of ill-considered Ill policy, and basically it meant shutting down the asylums, which you know, were you know, restrictive and, and kind of bleak places in, in, in many respects, but the, uh, psychiatric, the, the patients weren't really given the support uh, that they required once they were sort of released into the community. Um, two questions. The first one is the gender. It seems that most of the uh, images that we saw were all old women. And I wondered, it, it, the art that did survive and the art that made its way into the art world, what was the gender significance of those pieces A really good question. It's, it's one of the things that makes um, the Adamson collection unique because it has so many artworks by females. Um, and one of the things that we found really striking when we were doing the research is just how many women were incarcerated with, without actually being mentally ill. And, and I think also one of the other um, kind of really critical points is a lot of those women were incarcerated for decades, um, you know, 20, 30 years. Um, and, and I think, I mean, I'm sure that was equally, equally true of the men in the asylums, but there is, a, you know, the, one of the artists that we, we feature, William Kurilek, was only in a, you know, for a short stay in that asylum, whereas Gwyneth Rowlands, who produced The Flints, was there for 30 years. The second question has to do with schizophrenia and art. And, and when it makes its way into the gallery, uh, it takes on, as is said in the film, it takes on a different significance but how did critics uh, look at the work? Much, of, much outsider art is, is, has been done by what some have called schizophrenic people. Did any of that interest you as a question in your film? Uh, well, I, I think I would just say, uh, I mean, the, there is that debate. Maybe Pia can, can answer it. But from our point of view, we were, we were 
when we refer to the artists through the voiceover, uh, uh, we, we try not to kind of label them as schizophrenic. We, we, we say that they were diagnosed as schizophrenic, schizophrenics because it's impossible for us to say. And of course, at the time, there was a lot of mis misdiagnosis. Uh, and it's a very, you know, is that my understanding is that schizophrenia is actually a description of, of a spectrum of symptoms. Uh, as regards the relationship between art and schizophrenia, it's a really kind of complicated issue. And I'm going to pass it over to the PNI. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think there is a lot of debate about it, and that's partly why we're interested in making the film. Um, but I think one of the aspects is um, to see these folks decontextualised in the museums, which is why we found the format of film to be great, because you could contextualise it and put a story to these people. and I'm totally fine, but during the course of making this film, I was given the opportunity to do an art therapy class. Um, and I went to the class as a, you know, as a kind of film producer, and they did, they, it was exactly like it was in the movie, where they just give you the tools and say, create. And as a person that works in a creative industry, I was like, how do I know if it's good, and what am I supposed to do? And, what? and it really took me a while to go, it's not about that, it's just about a means of self-expression. And it was also this group class, where people um, share their experience. So, I don't know, it really resonated for me and, and it made me see also how it must have really meant a lot to these people to be able to have this outlet. I think for me, it was just a real privilege to work on it because it felt like we were excavating, um, or trying to excavate into people's stories that had really been, as, as the lady said earlier, abandoned. And I found that incredibly moving and also just a real pleasure to discover the work because some of it is absolutely extraordinary. So for me it's been you know it's been a hugely satisfying experience. I'd like to thank you guys for coming. Thanks everyone.